um, 34th, in fact, in Strive's monthly series. And we hope, if you haven't done so already, that you'll sign up to get the invitation for our monthly webinar. For anyone who doesn't know, Strive is a research consortium led from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with partners in India, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda. STRIVE focuses on the intersecting social and economic factors that shape vulnerability to HIV and on promising structural interventions to tackle these factors. And one intervention that's getting a lot of attention at the moment is um, that of cash transfers as a form of social protection. So we're really pleased to have Dr. Lucy Kluver present today. She's going to talk about structural solutions, the impact of cash and care provision on adolescent HIV prevention and adherence in Southern Africa. Lucy's Associate Professor at Oxford University and at the University of Cape Town, and she works closely with a lot of different agencies under the South African government to develop rigorous research in social protection children affected by HIV. Welcome, Lucy, and um, we look forward to your presentation and to discussion afterwards. Um, it's lovely to be here and, and to speak to, to you colleagues, and especially um, welcome on the callers, Professor Lorraine Scher and Alona Tosca, who've been very involved in these analyses that you'll see, and Jason Wolfe, who've many discussions in the back of um, meetings with ministers in sub-Saharan Africa have contributed to what's gone into this. So I'm going to dive right in. We're thinking about um, what, really thinking about what some of the latest evidence in this exciting new story about social protection and HIV prevention, particularly focused on adolescent girls, but thinking about adolescents more widely. So just to give some very brief background, this research, um, this set of research studies is a collaborative work with um, South African government, with a number of agencies, and with our teen advisory group. You can see a small photo of them at the bottom, who are 20 AIDS-affected kids who advise all our research. And really, it's aimed to inform policy and programming to make it um, provide the evidence that's most useful. I'm going to be using three main studies to talk about. Um, the first one was a national study of children in AIDS-affected families and other children. The second is a large community study of HIV-positive adolescents that's still ongoing. And the third is also ongoing, but an initiative to develop free child abuse prevention programs um, in the developing world. And if anyone has already done this and I've wrongly claimed it's the world first, then please tell me and I'll take it off. So the first study I'm going to talk about was a study that we conducted from 2008 to 2012. And I, I won't go into detail on the methodology except to say that what we did was we picked three provinces in South Africa, and then Mbeki got thrown out and Zuma um, came in and one of those provinces changed. And they were Western Cape and Pumalanga and KZN. And in each of those provinces, we randomly selected one urban and one rural health district, Within each of those health districts, we randomly selected census enumeration areas and then interviewed every single household with an adolescent aged between 10 and 17. What we found really surprised us. We'd intended really to do this study looking at the impacts of caring and, and family HIV on adolescents. But what we found when we looked was a set of impacts um, for adolescent girls in particular, but adolescent boys, of structural risks on their, H their risk of contracting HIV themselves. And if you look for an example at this slide, you can see on the left that a girl who lives in a healthy family um, is not abused and has enough to eat five days a week has a just under 1% chance of having transactional sex, which is sex in exchange for food or money or school fees, and usually with a much older man with a higher risk of HIV infection. If you look to the far right, you can see that a girl with an AIDS-sick parent who's experiencing abuse and hunger has a 57% chance of transactional sex. Now, of course, what this said to us was that rather than focusing and thinking solely about sexual risk behavior as a, as a, a behavioral risk, a, a set of poor choices that adolescents were making, we needed to think about structural risk. And at this point, we looked at the work that had been done elsewhere and realized that Strive had really already thought about this in far more complexity and subtlety than we had. And really, 
following from this, this diagram, which I'm sure many of you have seen as you've worked with STRIVE, we started to try and think about the structural risks associated with HIV infection for adolescents and what might be some of the social protections that could help that. Now, around this time, the World Bank was thinking a little differently. And what we saw coming out, this came out um, in, in 2013, was a study and a set of studies conducted by the World Bank. This one here is called the RESPECT study. And what they did essentially in this RCT in, in um, Tanzania was that they randomized um, young people to either no intervention or to two types of conditional cash transfer. Both of the conditional cash transfer programs, um, they had four monthly testing for sexually transmitted infections, and if they were clear of STIs, they got the cash transfer, which was either $10 or $20 randomized. And if they had a sexually transmitted infection, they didn't get the cash transfer. Now, this did show some HIV prevention effects. It also raised a set of questions, and particularly by uh, questions by um, partners like UNICEF and UNDP, who questioned some of the, both the practicality and the um, morality of doing this kind of conditional cash transfer. Interestingly, what the World Bank also published was the only study to date which has compared conditional cash transfers with unconditional cash transfers. This was a very famous study in um, Malawi called the Zomba trial, which showed that both conditional and unconditional cash transfers, these were conditional on education, reduced HIV prevalence amongst um, young women. It didn't make a difference whether those cash transfers were conditional or unconditional. A set of colleagues um, from USAID, PEPFAR, from, um, from UNICEF, from UNDP, from UNAIDS, and the International Labour Organization approached us and said, we're really interested in these unconditional cash transfers. Can you look in your data and try and see whether unconditional cash transfers could be reducing HIV risk for adolescents? It took us 18 months to work out how to do it with some complicated propensity score matching. But what we found was very clear, that families, adolescent girls living in families where they got an unconditional child-focused cash transfer. This was just the child support grant or the foster child grant intended as broad spectrum poverty alleviation in South Africa. It resulted in reductions in incidence rates of transactional sex with an odds ratio of 0.5, so that's a um, half, halved odds. And for age disparate sex, a reduction of two thirds of an odds ratio of, of 0.3. What was also interesting was what these grants didn't do. They didn't um, reduce any risks for boys, and they didn't reduce other kinds of risks. They didn't reduce casual sex, um, sex with multiple partners, sex when drunk or on drugs. It seemed to us that what was happening was that the cash transfers weren't preventing the, the kind of careless sex that teenagers have, but they were allowing adolescent girls to make healthier decisions about what kind of sexual partners they wanted to have. They weren't reliant on a sugar daddy to pay for their needs, or less reliant. Just around the same time, about two weeks after this paper, a study came out of Kenya which showed very similar findings. This is by Ashu Handa and colleagues. And this really excited a lot of policy interest, along with a study that came out on the child support grant in South Africa, which showed, again, impacts on, um, on young people's sexual activity related to accessing the child support grant. But the World Bank felt quite strongly that this research wasn't enough. And they said at, at repeated meetings that we needed to be thinking about what could address the sexual risk for boys and what could address sexual risk other than transactional and age disparate sex. And so we went back to the child development literature and said, can we look rather at not just cash, but cash plus care? And we looked at um, incidence rates of all the behavioral risks for HIV. We also double-checked because um, World Bank colleagues, again, questioned whether our outcome measures of these particular HIV risk behaviors were actually related to HIV um, incidence. And you'll see that the, the evidence, including a recent STRIVE meta-analysis, is, is very strong that those, those are valid HIV risk behaviors. So what kind of care did we look at? If you look to the left, you can see the kind of 
things that fell under cash, and to the right, the things that fell under care. Although we're starting to reconfigure that now and think of cash care and classroom with a clustering of school-based um, school positive influences. And what we found was, again, very interesting. For girls, cash alone did re result in a reduction in HIV risk behavior. This was mainly driven by the transactional and age disparate sex. But cash plus care resulted in a greater reduction. For, and, and for not only transactional and age disparate sex, but for all the HIV risk behaviors. For boys, cash alone had no effect, but cash plus care had an odds reduction of, of um, 0.5. So we're seeing greater impacts of adding cash onto care. At this point, we were really touring the world with colleagues at, at USAID and, um, and UNICEF and UNDP talking to governments um, in sub-Saharan Africa about this, this new research on social protection. And there was huge interest. And one of the key questions that they asked was, how does this work? What's going on? What, you know, does, is, is social protection a black box that we put in a cash transfer and we get out an outcome? So this set of new analyses are ones and still ongoing where we're trying to really work out that question. What we did was we looked at predictors of adolescent HIV risk in 2011 on the incidence rates of risk behavior in 2012. And we see very clearly a set of structural risk factors that closely reflect those that Strive um, theorized a couple of years before. We also see, however, that those structural risk factors lead into a set of family-based problems and, ch and teenager-based problems, which themselves lead into increased HIV risk behavior. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that social protection, cash, care, and classroom seem to be able to interrupt some of those pathways. And if you look here at this um, diagram, you can see the black lines are direct reduction influences. So care, cash, and classroom all directly reduce psychosocial risk, and classroom directly reduces, here we've got starving sex, which is transactional or age disparate sex. But the red lines are perhaps even more interesting. What they show us is what we call moderation effects, where cash, care, and classroom are working better for those who are most deprived. And this is really great because many interventions only really work for people who are less deprived. So cash, care, and classroom seem to work better. We also see when we look at careless sex, which was um, unprotected sex, multiple partners, and alcohol or drugs, we see a similar pattern of both direct and, in, and moderating effects of, um, of these interventions. But the policymakers weren't happy with this. They didn't really like the fact that we were clustering these interventions together. It was, it was lovely theoretically, but they, what they really wanted to know is what specific types of social protection should they be doing? Should they be doing cash transfers and food gardens? Or should they be doing encouraging parental monitoring and teacher support? They also wanted to know whether adding two or more social protections together would work better than one. And of course, they were fundamentally interested in how much this would cost and where the money was going to come from. So when we looked at specific combinations for HIV prevention, what we saw was a range of, I mean, this is effectively just a multivariate regression where we put all of the different types of so potential social protection in with a range of controls and looked at what survived, what impacted incidents of HIV risk behavior. And the ones in pale gray were significant at 0.1, the ones in dark gray are significant at um, 0.05. And what we see is a, is a range of surviving um, social protections, but certainly for most, more than one social protection was surviving. I've actually forgotten to color in a couple of the pale gray ones. Apologies, I'll, I'll fix that. What was also exciting was that we found clear evidence of additive or cumulative effects. And if you look at this diagram, this is um, for boys, and this is the probability incidence of careless sex with, um, with modeled marginal effects, which my brilliant master's student worked out how to do, and I wouldn't have a clue. But what we see here is that a boy with none of these particular interventions has about a 22% chance of incidence of careless sex in the following year. With good monitoring, free school or teacher support, that reduces to around 15 to 
With any two of those combinations, it reduces to around 10%. And with all of those interventions together, we see a reduction from around 22% to around 5%. If we look at girls, you'll notice boys are in blue and girls are in pink. When I tried to change this round to be politically correct, it caused chaos for all of us. So we're sticking with that. For girls, if we look at um, careless sex, we see that with no intervention, there's about 15% incidence. With either good parental monitoring or school feeding, we see about 10% incidence. And with both together, that's reduced to around 6 or 7%. The question, the question just came up about how careless sex is being measured. We use self-report measures um, in a kind of cool teen magazine format with a picture of Rihanna looking gorgeous um, and, and got really quite high measures of response. If we look at economically driven sex or starving sex, we're trying to think of a good name for it, we see again a combined effect. With no intervention, it's around 10%. With either a child grant or free school, it's around 5%. And with both, it's around 2%. And again, with pregnancy, we see a similar set of combinations. What's, it, what's interesting and what we're still thinking about with this is that it's not that any two combinations or any three combinations work. They seem to be very specific combinations of specific interventions, reduce specific types of HIV risk for boys or for girls. Moving on from this, um, I wanted to talk a bit about the potential and some very new and ongoing work of social protection in impacting HIV prevention and adolescent ART adherence. And this is particularly a study that we're doing in the Eastern Cape of South Africa in a health district we've visited every single state health facility and found lists of every, well, trailed through the files of every adolescent who ever started antiretroviral therapy in the clinics. We're then tracing those adolescents to their homes and interviewing them. We're on about 700 right now and we're hoping to get to 1,000. And when we looked at their adherence, what we see is rates of about 36% non, self-reported non-adherence, which is highly correlated with um, opportunistic infections. When we looked at the predictors of non-adherence, we saw some very clear structural and biomedical drivers. We see odds ratios of around two for medication side effects, hunger, abuse, and domestic violence, and depression, and odds ratios of about 1.5 for attention deficit disorder and behavior problems. And again, we see cumulative effects. With none of these risk factors, it's around 13% non-adherence. With hunger, side effects, and attention deficit, around 44% non-adherence. Again, when we started to try and look at social protection, we start to see some evidence of impact. And we see um, reductions in, in non-adherence or improvements in adherence related to free school meals, parental monitoring, and social support. With again on the right, you can see some evidence, encouraging evidence of cumulative effects. Now, one of the things that we realized when we did these analyses was that many of the social protection interventions we wanted to look at, we couldn't because there just weren't enough kids accessing things like weekly um, support um, groups. And so one of the reasons we're extending our baseline and trying to increase our sample is so we can look at some of these less well-accessed social protections. So, so we really watch this space. We, we should have more data and better analyses soon. One of the things that came up consistently in these discussions about social protection was around parenting. And it's clear that parenting is an important part of the cash and care social protection um, provision. But there were some questions around how can we improve parenting. And so I just wanted to report some very brief pre-post results from an ongoing initiative with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and a range of governments to develop and test evidence-based, free, NGO-led child abuse prevention programs for the, for the developing world. And as you can see on the right, we've just reached the end of the pre-post test um, in 2014 with 224 participants, and we're in the delightful stage of gearing up to try and start a randomized control trial in two weeks' time. And just very briefly, some of the pre-post test results, we can see reductions in physical and emotional abuse um, and in poor monitoring and improvements in positive parenting. We also saw 
um, improvements in reductions in depression and anxiety um, and parenting stress and parental alcohol use, um, improvements in social support. We didn't see an effect on teen alcohol and drug use, um, but we did see an effect on other teen behavioral problems. Of course, this is only pre-post-test results, and so take it with a good pinch of salt, but some indicative evidence of um, certainly no harm and potential for, for um, positive impacts. Now, of course, the last thing that policymakers really want to know is how much will this cost and where will we find the money? And this is where I'm talking to the best possible people um, to understand about this, but I would just really recommend you look at Strive's work, particularly Michelle Remy's work, on cross-sectoral um, funding of these social protection interventions. Um, and they've modeled that on the Malawi trial, which you heard about at the beginning, and just some really clear and instructive evidence, which has very much contributed to the debate and discussion with policymakers that's allowed a move forward in the social protection policy planning agenda. So I'd like to end by saying thank you very much to all our patient and loyal funders, but also to give some very clear um, summary of, of, of what does the evidence suggest so far. What we're seeing is that unconditional cash transfer does seem to reduce adolescent risk, that combining cash care and classroom gives us better effects and does seem to buffer some of the structural risk factors and the structural drivers of HIV. We're seeing cumulative impacts of specific um, joining of combinations of interventions for um, both adherence and for HIV prevention. And what's perhaps valuable about these studies, although they're not randomized trials, is that they show effectiveness in real-world conditions in sub-Saharan Africa. These are not beautifully controlled programs. They're just what's naturally existing. Um, and just to end, um, I'd like to end with the words of Nicolo, who's one of our teen advisory groups. And that's her. She came down to the World Health um, Organization building for the UNAIDS um, uh, PCB a board meeting last year, and this was her words of thinking about how social protection had helped her. Thanks very much, and I look forward to questions. Lucy, thanks so much. That was a really, really fascinating presentation. And um, I'm sure that lots of people have questions and comments. It's interesting for, Stri for all of us at Strive across all the different kinds of work we do. And as you say, really important for, the, for adolescent girls as a particularly vulnerable group. So I'd like to call on anyone involved. Oh, Meghna Ranganathan has her hand raised. So Meghna, would you unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Hi, Lucy. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I just had, I mean, it's, it's sort of a question around sort of going back to what you said, and it's something that I, I've also been thinking of um, along with colleagues around um, the impact of social protection. And I had a question. It's more sort of a discussion point around how you would um, consider when you, have, when you have cash transfers as a social protection mechanism where it's addressing poverty and education overall versus sort of cash given as an incentive for behavior change. So, um, you know, most recently I just read the abstract in Cro at, the, at the CROI uh, meeting, and it wasn't for adolescents, but it was a study that showed that giving financial incentives um, did not, and paying people to adhere to taking drugs, um, actually didn't show any effect, and it was a, it's a recent study, but I haven't been able to actually get the full study, um, which sort of goes back to the point of of, of safety net versus um, financial incentives, which is, the, you know, the RESPECT study was more around targeting behavior change. So I just sort of wanted to get your perspective on how you would sort of view social protection when it sort of t tackles these two streams. That's a great, great question, and Magna, your thesis is sitting in my inbox, and I'm looking forward to reading it. This is, I mean, this is really at the heart of, of a huge and ongoing debate that's happening in, in the cash transfer area, 
with the World Bank pushing very strongly for conditional or, or incentives-based approach to, to particularly cash transfers, and other NGOs like UNICEF and, and UNDP pushing very strongly for unconditionality, with, with, a, with a range of international organizations wavering between the two currently. And I think it, what's really interesting about this debate is that there's three things contributing to it. There's a, there's, there's a contribution of evidence, and, a, and in some ways this is a fight over who has the best evidence, and this also turns into a fight over whether a randomized controlled trial with greater internal validity is worth more than a, than a longitudinal survey with greater external validity. But mm -hmm. it's also a debate about people's conceptions of, of what's moral and what's right, and one of the strong arguments against the conditional cash transfers is what if someone is raped and, and contracts an STI or HIV AIDS, you know, purely out of, without their choice, um, mm -hmm. and is then deprived, you know, is both, both discovers their status and then has their cash transfer withdrawn from them. But I think it's also a, about a fundamental difference in views of, of, of human behavior. And one side of it is the incentive view is a, is a view of human behavior that you essentially you model or mold people's behavior by providing them with something that they want more. And, and there, was a, there was a slide that the World Bank used to show with a picture of a young boy with two thought bubbles. And one, one thought bubble was a naked woman, and then the other thought bubble was a dollar sign. And it, it very much conveyed how they thought about these, these choices. And the other view is, is a view that, you, that people will make better decisions if you reduce their, the, the, the intense structural risks that they're living in and give them the opportunity to make their own decisions through unconditional support. You, you probably know which side of the debate I feel most strongly about, but I think everyone needs to make their decisions on this based on the evidence. No, absolutely. I, um, I, I, I mean, it was just more sort of a, it's, it's an ongoing debate, but I was just interested, curious to hear sort of your perspective on it. What do um, I think? Given the reason. Yeah. All the way. <laughs> <laughs> Only as useful as the evidence backing it. Yeah, of course. No, but I actually had a follow-up question, if, um, which is sort of related to, um, you know, aspirations of adolescent girls, because, you know, within the adolescent age group and spectrum, um, you know, different the girls have different needs at different ages and age groups. And um, I was wondering whether you all sort of also including when you, when you were talking about cash plus care, whether there was any discussion around, you know, linking it to income generation and financial literacy programs, which ultimately help like the older age group girls um, to sort of get over the, the education to job. So it sort of helps us bridging that age group, which also tends to be very vulnerable, so post-18 before 24. Great question. It wasn't in our data because none of our adolescents were receiving anything like that. But that right. could be the next study that you do and would be a really <laughs> interesting and valuable one. I'm going to move on to some of the questions. The parenting intervention, which we're about to evaluate in the RCT, is called the Synovio Teen Program. It's part of this overarching initiative called Parenting for Lifelong Health. And if you Google Parenting for Lifelong Health, it pops up with the WHO website and some information about it. But essentially, it's a parenting intervention that looks very much like the evidence-based programs that you'll see um, in the developed world, uh, Triple P, Incredible Years. And there's, there's a set of very well evidence-based ones. But this, this is something that's been designed specifically using the same core principles, but designed for, um, designed for very low resource context. So it's designed to be run by a community worker um, with no videos, no, no equipment. Um, you know, it, c it can be run in an in a old church um, on, on a shoestring, which is exactly what we're doing with the trial. It's a 15-session weekly um, group meeting with both parents and teenagers. And they do um, programs um, and joint work on things like positive praise and um, problem solving together and thinking about risks for abuse in the community. And we're very happy to share um, the manuals, although we're still working on the final version if anyone's interested. Um, Peter Baker, something about negative results. Right, really interesting. Which transfers don't work and which factors are not impacted by these programs. Um, that's 
that's that's always the killer question, isn't it? I did say that cash transfers don't work for boys, and they don't cash transfers alone don't work for boys, and they don't work on careless sex. But I think um, I think what we what we're seeing, particularly with the social protection combinations, is that it seems that different types of social protection and different combinations of social protection work on different things. So it's not providing a cash transfer and a school feeding scheme will hit some of the problems and it will certainly reduce um, HIV risk for adolescent girls in terms of transactional and age disparate sex, but you're not going to affect some other types of risk and, um, and risks amongst boys with just those two interventions. You need to add in parental monitoring and, and the other combinations that will affect those. So I think we're, we're certainly, in some ways I think we'd hoped to find the kind of winning two and then we could go out to policymakers and say, you know, all you need to do is school feeding and parental monitoring and, and this is going to solve the problem. And really that wasn't what we found. It, it, was, it was specific and different combinations. The other thing that's worth thinking about when we look at these results is that we don't have, is what we don't have in the survey. So we didn't have measures of biomedical interventions like circumcision. Um, we didn't have PrEP, well, partly because, you know, PrEP didn't really exist when we, when we were doing the data collection. But what I think would be a really interesting new set of research studies would be to look at combinations of social protections and biomedical interventions and potentially education interventions, although we should point out we did test HIV knowledge as part of these analyses, and it did nothing and had no impact on anything that we tried. Bridget, I hope I'm saying your name right. We've been in email contact. Um, but there was a good question here about the fact that the research is currently focused primarily on, on preve HIV prevention, but not necessarily on um, sexual violence and sexual exploitation. You know, this is an exciting new field. What I, what I would say is that this work on social protection and HIV prevention is so new. You know, we're, we're really still working on many of these analyses and, and other colleagues are working on theirs. But what I think we really do need to look at as well as whether social protection can reduce um, other kinds of HIV risk, particularly sexual violence. What I can tell you is that cash transfers alone don't seem to reduce that in our in our studies, but we haven't started looking at combinations yet, and that's one of the things on our list for the next six months. Sorry, Bridget, I wish I could give you a clear answer right now, but we're, we're, we're running to try and catch up at the moment. Um, and the next question was, how have social protection measures impacted on, on education outcomes? That's a, that's a great question, and I can tell you because we've done the analyses, but we haven't written them up yet. Um, we found that for both boys and girls who are living in kind of healthy-ish family situations, that getting a cash transfer reduced school dropout by around half. But for girls who are orphaned, it reduced school dropout, I think, by six times. It was a huge impact on school dropout and seemed to be most important for the most vulnerable. If anyone's the journal editor of wherever we're going to send that, then apologies for, for ruining the scoop, but we're, we're still working on those those particular analyses. Thanks so much, Lucy. I see that we have a thank you from Peter Baker, and I wondered if anyone else has questions or comments that they'd like to raise right now. Peter's got a question about, these are all individual level studies, and have the results been replicated by population or ecological level studies? Really interesting. No, not as far as I know. But I think there's real potential with the program. So, so, of course, what's complex about that question is that when you introduce the social protection programming, the, the HIV epidemic is also doing its own things, and it's affected by all sorts of things, like the, the rates of, of infectiousness and ART and, you know, where, whether the epidemic's plateauing and, and all kinds of other things. So, so, so I think there would be great complexities to doing that but certainly not impossible. I think where there would be potential would be to look at in places like the demographic surveillance sites um, in South Africa and, and Malawi and, and Kenya. But also potentially the UNICEF have a project called the Transfer Project where they're doing um, randomized um, rollouts, randomized national rollouts, very much like they did in um, Mexico with Progressa, but of, of unconditional social protection programs. 
And that would be a potentially a great opportunity to look at that kind of thing. I couldn't do it, but maybe you guys could. It'd be great. Bridget has a great. question about um, thinking how we're thinking about addressing sexual violence prevention in combination with cash. <laughs> this is a really, really good and really tough question because the, the evidence from the developed world on how to prevent sexual violence, and of course we're thinking of sexual violence both within the home and outside the home and, and quite different causal mechanisms there. The evidence in the developed world is, is pretty poor on this. And when you look at things like the WHO systematic review of reviews that they did a, a few years ago, which looked at um, what predicted, you know, what were effective programs in reducing violence against um, children, only parenting programs came out as, as consistently effective. And so it, it looks like parenting programs at the moment, although we're not sure that they're really fantastic at, at preventing sexual violence, they seem to work quite well at preventing emotional and physical abuse, seem to be our best bet so far. But I just think this is a, a huge gap for research that's absolutely necessary to do. What we're going to do is to be looking at all sorts of different combinations of social protection which the family might access and see if that's reducing kids' exposure to sexual violence. But we, we haven't got there yet and it's still it's still um, written on the backs of envelopes and stuck on the side of my office wall in various configurations to try out in structural equation modelling. Got a question, got a set of that's questions. That's from Pretty. Brilliant. I'm curious to know if any social protection schemes also says skill building or employment. I absolutely agree, and, and really, as Meghna said, I, I think this is, this is potentially the next step that we should be looking at. And the reason why I think it's also really important to look at this is because much of the social protection programs, like the child support grants or education programs, are going to stop when kids turn about 18 which we know is also an incredibly high-risk period. The kind of 19 to 24 is a very high-risk period for infection rates. And so, to me, this is, the next, this is the next big thing. And I would encourage colleagues at Strive to really look at this if you can. I, I just think it, it's really important and needs to be done by people who understand it as well, which we don't. Great. And then we have um, another question. Have we come across any opposition to conditional or unconditional cash transfers? Oh, that's an interesting question. And the local ethics committee opposed it. Maybe you should have given them some small cash transfers themselves. They might have changed their minds. What we have come... This is an interesting question. We have come across opposition. Some of that opposition has come from... We, we got, a, we got a, quite a roasting by, by a, um, a group of Catholic... Um, NGOs who felt strongly that it, that it wasn't a good idea, either conditional or unconditional. But um, the main objections we've had have been either the general public or governments asking us whether cash transfers aimed at children, um, child cash transfers, would encourage teenage girls to get pregnant. And there's a kind of prevailing myth that if you provide a child cash transfer, however small, that teenage girls will get pregnant to get the cash transfer. And of course, there's some anecdotal evidence that this is true, but overwhelmingly the research evidence shows that the opposite is true, and that, that girls who get a, receive a cash transfer as teenagers are less likely to get pregnant, not more likely to get pregnant in the hopes of getting the cash transfer. So that's really where we've had objection to unconditional um, cash transfers. And then, of course, our colleagues at the World Bank and other people who really believe in behavioral economics um, feel quite strongly that we shouldn't be doing unconditional cash transfers and that they should be conditional. But I'm sorry that you had a grumpy local ethics committee. Bridget, yes, I'd be great, be great to have a talk about this, and I know you're doing some exciting new stuff in, in the area of, of sexual violence, so it'd be brilliant to talk about it. If there are no more questions right this minute... I'm sure people will want to follow up later and, and keep in touch. And it just I'm just left to thank Lucy so much for giving us this time in your busy life. And um, these are extremely important questions, and we really, really value your insights and look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs>